Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Preserving and Editing Old Photographs, the Overson Collection. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner. We're here uh, talking about preserving and editing old photographs. In particular, we're going to use an, as an example the Overson negatives. Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson was my great grandmother, and she was born in 1878 and died in 1968. She died shortly after I got married. And some of my memories of her, she was one of the few uh, people of my grandparents that lived near us and that we saw frequently. And Grandma Overson would come for um, holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and we'd uh, we'd talk. But my last big experience with her was driving uh, from Phoenix up into eastern Arizona, where we were, where she was going to visit some family, and uh, my wife and I drove her through all of the small towns. And when we came to Snowflake, Arizona, she uh, was commenting about that when she arrived in Snowflake, everyone there was living in dugouts, meaning dirt houses dug out of the side of the hills, and uh, she arrived in a wagon. So we had a kind of a connection going back to uh, what we thought was, was old history. But uh, one of the important things was that she was a professional photographer. Also, my great-great-grandfather, her father, uh, George, uh, excuse me, Charles Godfrey DeFries Jarvis, uh, was also a professional photographer. And when Graham Overson died, uh, that was a long time before I became interested in, in uh, genealogy and, and uh, anything about family history. But uh, when I did become interested, and then over the years, and uh, then when my father died, I realized that the, uh, the question that came up was, well, whatever happened to all of Grandma Overson's photos and negatives? Uh, when when my father went through my father's things, we found one box of, uh, of photos and negatives, not uh, most of which were actually his rather than Grandma Overson's. Um, so that was kind of a mystery that that hung out there for years and years. And finally, uh, a few years ago, I was uh, talking with my daughter, and uh, I uh, she has a blog. And we decided, and we were talking about whatever happened to the, the overs and negatives, what happened to all of the, uh, the photographs. And she said, well, we'll put it in the blog and see what happens. So she wrote a short post on her blog about uh, looking for the uh, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson photographs. Well, nothing happened. About three years later, it was right after Christmas uh, a few years ago, uh, I got a call from Amy and said, guess what? Uh, late Christmas present, uh, we just got a call from one of our cousins, and he has all of the photographs. And so we began the process of uh, negotiating. We called, I called him immediately, and it turned out that uh, at that time I was living in Mesa, Arizona, and he was living in Phoenix, Arizona. I would have driven any place in the country to, uh, to get those photographs, but uh, uh, fortunately I didn't have to drive very far. Uh, we got the photographs, and it turned out that uh, they were in two very large Rubbermaid containers, the, the like 40-gallon size or whatever, they're giant ones. And uh, these were glass negatives primarily. Uh, 
Um, and I looked at the boxes and I thought, well, there's probably around a thousand, <clears throat> thousand photos there. Well, I was only off by about three or four times that many, but uh, they weighed close to probably between the two boxes over a hundred pounds. And my wife and I could just barely get them into the back of our car and uh, get them home. Um, the understanding that we had was that I would digitize these and then I would find a uh, an ultimate repository place for them to go. What we have on the screen right now is a picture of Graham Overson, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson, and her twin sons. So we now know what happened to uh, those negatives and the, the blog that uh, that had those that we posted that on is our family blog called the ancestorfiles.blogspot.com. This is maintained by my daughter and she has put on there hundreds and hundreds of, of biographies and uh, documents and uh, all sorts of information about both of her family lines, which includes my wife's family as well as my family. The thousands of photos um, that we got uh, taught us some lessons, and the lessons that we learned from this were, first of all, if you're if you're interested in finding uh, old documents and particularly photographs, you've got to be persistent. Uh, this is something that takes um, some effort. Um, it also helps to use the internet. Uh, if you have uh, access uh, to the internet, you should be able to create a blog or create a website or use Facebook or any number of other social media programs, but primarily it needs to be like a blog because it'll sit there and be searchable. The reason why uh, my cousin was able to find it was that he was searching the internet with the idea of finding someone who would be interested in the photos. And it was because of the post that my daughter put on her blog that he was uh, able to contact us and we were able to save the photos. One of the concerns that he had, of course, was that uh, he was quite old and, uh, and not too well, and he needed, uh, he was very concerned that some of the, that they would be lost, uh, that the family would not preserve them. And he had actually, he was actually a professional photographer and had been carrying them around, uh, carting them around, I would, would be a better term, uh, for about 30 years before he found uh, found us and our interest in preserving and and uh, and distributing the the copies out to the to the mem to the uh, family members and then this the third pro lesson is that you need to be ready when the when these things show up uh, it, it, this is partially a a, a a mental state you really need to to be in the state of mind that when people offer you uh, things from the family that you're ready and willing and able to take those and not uh, not worry about where you're going to keep them or what you're going to do with them particularly. But it does help if you know what to do with the photographs and, uh, and other things that you might receive. And that's part of the reason why we're recording this post, uh, this, excuse me, not post, but webinar in order to, um, to help to understand how and what you might do with some of these kinds of collections of documents and and uh, other types of, of, uh, of photographs and and other memorable memorabilia now what can we learn from old photographs um, it, that's interesting because most of the time when you're doing genealogical research you don't have an image of the people that you're finding in your mind uh, photography is is fairly recent invention um, recent in the sense of the long history of mankind. Um, the earliest photography, and we'll, I'll cover this a little bit more later on, but it dates from the 1840s, 1850s. And so many of our ancestors, of course, were never preserved. Other than they were rich enough to have somebody paint their picture or something, there was probably no uh, nothing to show what they looked like. Today, though, and since the invention of photography, there uh, we can have a real emotional and direct contact with our ancestors. There's something about seeing the picture of the person that you're looking for that that creates this 
bond between you and uh, your the people that you're researching. So let's look at some of the photos and decide what we might learn from some of the old photos. Here is a, uh, a, a school class. These photos were taken in uh, Apache County, Arizona. Uh, that's on the eastern border uh, with New Mexico, and it extends for about uh, 200 miles long and about 75, 50 to 75 miles wide. Uh, so it's a narrow, long county along the eastern border of Arizona. And uh, it, the town of St. John's, which is the county seat of Apache County, and that's where my grandmother lived, my great-grandmother, uh, was established in about 1878, say 1879. And um, so the time period that when she was there was uh, from the very earliest times. And you can see here, and if you note the, the hairstyles on the, the young woman here in, the, in this photograph, uh, you could probably take any one of those young men and what they're wearing and stick them into the a classroom today. Well, probably not a classroom, but uh, they probably could walk around at the mall or on a Sunday and they would look pretty, uh, pretty normal. Uh, the, the young women would probably attract a little bit of attention with their hairstyles. So we could see school classes. Uh, this is a sports team, uh, all those lettermen. And, and when we're looking at these photos, uh, it turns out that many of the people in these photos are my relatives. So it's, it was even doubly interesting to see the old photographs and also discover that some of those people in that photograph were, were relatives and related to you. Uh, this is a view of the, the small town of St. John's, Arizona. Uh, hard to see there in the background. If you look down the street where the telephone poles are going or the power poles are going, you see a, a person on a horse riding up the street. Um, if you were to go there today and you took this from exactly the same spot, other than the fact that the road would probably be paved and there probably wouldn't be a telephone pole down the middle of the road, you're more, you'd, you'd be just as likely to see somebody on a horse riding up that road. So town views were an interesting thing and much more. And we'll look at some of this a little bit later. But let's talk a little bit about glass negatives. What are glass negatives? Well, uh, we need to know a little bit about the history of photography in order to understand that. But basically, glass negatives were, this, were what we would call the substrate, the substance on, on which the photograph was taken. Uh, most of what you see in large view cameras uh, are, are, were, were using glass negatives. The earliest photography is, uh, came from uh, France, was invented by a man by the name of Daguerre, and uh, his, his process of creating a, uh, an image was called a daguerreotype. Uh, it, there was a similar process discovered at, the sa at around the same time, and this is around 1838 and, uh, in England. And so there's some dispute between English and French as to who was the first inventor of photography. But the daguerreotype uses a uh, chemical solution primarily based on, on silver uh, that is uh, coated onto a metal plate and the metal plate then creates a negative image, which you can then see by reflection off of the metal plate. Um, a, a second uh, type of, of uh, photography that was followed that was called a calotype. Or the calotypes were uh, a negative positive. In other words, they uh, you could look at that and see a positive image of the, uh, of the person and later development, one, one type of, of uh, similar process that was developed coating a metal plate in the United States particularly was called a tin type. And uh, if you find an, a very, very old photograph and it's on a metal, piece of metal, uh, chances are it's likely a, a tin type. If it's very, very old in a very small case, uh, particularly an ornate uh, framed case, uh, it may very well be a daguerreotype, so it could go back in. And it takes 
uh, usually takes an examination by an expert to tell some of the differences between uh, the different processes in order to date um, the uh, photograph accurately. Eventually, uh, they used a, what's called collodion, a, a chemical process, to fix the, the uh, light-sensitive material to a glass plate. Uh, this was called a wet plate development process. Uh, if the, if the uh, photographic plate dried out um, in the process of after taking the picture and, and before it could be processed, then, then the, the quality would degrade rapidly. Um, it, it was a very complicated process because uh, you had to keep the plates dark after putting the uh, coating on them. And then uh, once they were uh, exposed to light, they needed to be kept uh, wet or damp until they were developed. And then the developing process fixed the image onto the, onto the glass plate. These glass plates were just on window glass. It's just regular glass, and they weighed a whole lot. And that was what all of the weight was in that in those boxes that we got, uh, was just a, two huge, huge boxes of glass, um, very heavy. Uh, eventually, uh, the substrate, uh, the substance in which the, pho the photographs were fixed was became celluloid. And the celluloid was, um, uh, with gelatin, and gelatin is uh, a, an organic substance, and it had the silver compound, the silver nitrate compounds in that that were light sensitive. And uh, it enabled, because it was celluloid, was flexible, then you could cut it into to strips, and that's where you got roll film. Uh, the roll film was the kind of film that, that was used in the early Kodak uh, cameras and some of the other cameras that developed uh, that were the predecessors of, of modern film. Eventually, of course, we got the modern film process and prints from these, from the glass plates and from the gelatin and celluloid could be made onto paper. And so there were paper uh, photographs that were uh, began to be common. And those appeared uh, in the in the mid uh, in the late I call it the mid-late 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, are some of the earliest photographs you'll find printed onto paper, and then into the 1900s. And, and glass plates were used until uh, very commonly until around 1920. And after 1920, uh, roll film became more available, and um, paper and the, and the uh, celluloid and later, and later other substances that were used that weren't quite as flammable um, for, um, for to make the negatives for photographs. So here's a copy, a picture of a glass negative. Um, it, there's a, you can see the image is a negative image, meaning the, the, the image is reversed and it's just a piece of glass um, that you can pick up and all. Understanding that in, in attempting to learn how to develop or to reproduce these negatives using um, my own digital equipment was, uh, was an extreme challenge. So what I had to do to digit, digitize these photos is shown in this setup here. Um, I tried all sorts of things. I tried scanning them on flatbed scanners. Uh, the problem was that uh, if you use the transmitted light from the scanner, uh, the, the surface of the glass negative would reflect that light, and you would uh, you would really get a, a washed out sort of, uh, of scan. Um, we tried about every kind of reproducing I could, and then I thought of the idea of using transmitted light. In other words, the light source either at the side or below the negative and then taking a picture of the negative. Now this required a, a, a change in the, um, in the technology because um, the digital camera that's shown here, this Canon camera, had to, pro had to become uh, high enough quality of uh, what we call megapixels or the number of, of little discrete image dots that are available to the camera 
the number of megapixels had to exceed, as I found out over the years of, of uh, comparing uh, digitized photos of, of uh, digitized images made of photographs uh, before they became acceptable and up to the quality of a scanned or flatbed scanned image, they, the number of megapixels had to go past 20 megapixels. So until I got a 20 megapixel plus camera, uh, the quality was much worse, depending on the, the number of megapixels, obviously, uh, than a flatbed scanning image. Once we got above 20 megapixels, then the camera image, the, the phot photographic images began to be acceptable. I was still challenged here, and one of the problems was the light source. And that's another technological thing that needed to happen because a regular light bulb, an incandescent light bulb in that box would have created enough heat to have severely damaged the negatives. Um, and so it was necessary to have some, uh, a light source without a, a heat. And that uh, required the development of the LED or LCD um, bulbs that they have today. And I use this very bright LED light. Um, then the next challenge was the fact that uh, we needed to have it on a camera stand so that the camera was it directly uh, perpendicular to the surface of the, of the glass negative. Any movement of the camera off of 90 degree angle above the, the glass negative would, would cause distortion in the photograph. So the camera stand was necessary. And then the last challenge that had to be overcome was the fact that uh, when I put the light source underneath the negative, you could see the bright light spots from the light source. So uh, it's just like a flashlight. Uh, you would see the circle where the light was, and then the light would diffuse from that. Well, we overcame that with a uh, piece of um, uh, a frosted plastic, the kind that are used in the in the uh, light boxes that you see in in fast food restaurants and other places that change their menus all the time. Uh, they have big lights behind those, but you can't see the lights because the substance they use, which is a plastic substance, diffuses the light. So we had some of that around uh, because of our our graphic design business and uh, used a piece to diffuse the light. So all, the, all of the parts came together to be able to reproduce the photos. So here's the list. What you'd need is a high resolution camera, which I, which I mentioned had to be at least 20 megapixels, an LED light source, a glass plate, backlit film, and uh, which is the, the plastic film you've t used in the uh, in many stores and fast food places where you usually always see it, and a camera stand. And then the high part, high tech part of this, of course, is that cardboard box that I cut the holes in, uh, had to get it so that that worked. It was high enough for the LED light. Um, even then, when you take a picture of the negative, what you get is a picture of a negative. Uh, an image, a uh, digital image of a negative. So I have to develop the negatives. And you do that by inverting the image and then adjusting the exposure, cropping the image, and other photo manipulation things that needs to be done in order to produce a positive image from the glass plate negative. Uh, that we use, For that, we used um, to um, a program called Photoshop. Uh, you could use another program, uh, Lightroom, which is an Adobe program, Adobe Lightroom. Uh, Adobe Bridge also has that capability. And uh, Adobe uh, Photoshop Elements, uh, a more inexpensive program, also has the capability of um, enhancing the photos and, and uh, inverting them. Uh, there are probably others, uh, hunt, there are probably dozens of other uh, programs out there that would invert the photos and create a positive image. Um, I will have to say that Photoshop is this is the uh, a program of choice of most of photographers who are involved in in uh, serious photographic concerns. Okay, so what happened to the photos? All of those original photos and glass uh, uh, negatives went uh, to be preserved and conserved. Uh, 
and eventually made on, uh, available online by the University of Arizona. Um, uh, it's been a couple of years, a very, very slow process. It ended up that there were just over 6,300 images when we got through, when I got through digitizing all of the um, negatives and uh, by converting them into positives. There were uh, about 4,300 uh, 4,400 uh, distinct images plus the negative images. I'm positive images plus the, the negative images. So the real question here is that if you uh, have a, a, a number of old photos or you have a, a big collection that you inherit from, uh, from someone, uh, what will happen to your photos? Um, uh, the best thing we have right today is that once we have digitized the photos, we're able to put those photos up on uh, the internet. Um, and presently, these photos are being put up uh, on FamilySearch.org's memories. And uh, with, the, with the photos up on the memories program of photos of FamilySearch.org, the photos are then freely, uh, anyone can look at them. They're searchable on Google, and they are um, uh, going to be preserved and available to anyone uh, to view. Uh, important to understand that during the time that my great grandmother and her father were, uh, my great great grandfather were uh, taking photographs in eastern Arizona from around 1880s until 1940, they probably took pictures of almost every person in the town. Uh, we have large group shots in there and uh, a lot of students and things. And I would guess that if your family lived in that area during that time period, uh, you were uh, had at least one or more photographs taken by my grandmother or her father. Now, when we have a photograph, we can uh, use different techniques for uh, digitizing them. The first is scanning using a flatbed scanner. And if you have a positive print, in other words, a, 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 a print of a, of a negative, then your, um, when, you do, when you use a flatbed scanner, you'll get the highest quality. The minimal uh, resolution that you would use for scanning on a flatbed scanner would be 300 dots per inch. Now, dots per inch is a uh, isn't exactly a correct terminology for what the, the scanner does. It's really pixels per inch uh, that you're you're worried about, but uh, or lines per inch is another uh, measure of the resolution. But be that as it may, uh, the scanners as they are now being sold today, flatbed scanners. Are um, measure everything in terms of dots per inch. So using a flatbed scanner is very inexpensive. You can buy a very high quality, uh, totally useful scanner for well under $100. Um, they're going to be slow, and that's one of the, the problems. They're very time consuming to scan. and uh, it takes, still takes a lot of time to identify the photos. So when you sit down to scan hundreds of photos, um, as people do here in the Brigham Young University Family History Library, um, with the scanning equipment that's available here for, the, for public use, uh, scanning them is just the beginning of the problem uh, of, the, of, the, of the issue. Because basically, after you've scanned all your images, you're going to have to sit there and figure out who's in the pictures and identify all the, all the photos. Now, you can use a high megapixel dig digital camera to take a picture of a picture. So if I have a photograph, I can put it on my, on my camera stand or in a light box, which will avoid having any kind of shadows, and take a picture of it. The problem with that is that the camera is very expensive. Uh, to buy a 20 megapixel camera today is less expensive than it was less expensive than it was a few years ago. Um, I purchased a 20 megapixel camera that has a really fine lens and does a very adequate job of taking pictures for around $350. It was a so it's a Sony camera, but to get a high-end camera that has the the full frame. Um, 
called the full frame sensor or 35 millimeter equivalent camera is going to cost um, in the neighborhood of two to three thousand dollars for the camera body. So you you probably uh, you know unless you're really serious into this you'll probably uh, be satisfied with the scanner. You do you can get higher quality, however, uh, up to today uh, the um, uh, the megapixel range on the cameras has gone uh, extremely high. In fact, the Canon cameras are in excess of 50 megapixel camera. Uh, you should be able to get uh, as as absolute quality. Understand this on quality. Uh, you cannot exceed the quality of the original photograph. So <laughs> no matter how good your scanner is or how good your camera is, you can't, uh, you can't get any better image than is already there. And uh, there are limitations on photographic processes. Um, although they're what they're called is continuous tone and they don't, they don't have uh, visible little dots, but if you use a, a, a very high magnification against a, on a photograph, you'll begin to see that the uh, that the individual crystals of the of the chemicals start to show. But uh, scanning with a high megapixel digital camera is very efficient because uh, you can take pictures basically as fast as you can move the the uh, photographs in front of the camera but you still have to identify them and that still takes a lot of time. Now, once you have digitized a file, it's important that you save the file in a lossless format. Now, what does that mean? First of all, the com most common way of, of taking a, a photograph, of if, if you're using a smart phone, for example, or a point and shoot, a consumer type camera, um, almost universally they will produce what's called a JPEG, JPG or JPEG image. And that is lossy. What that means is that if you modify the image at all, you begin to lose data. <clears throat> it isn't a matter of, um, uh, of being intentionally making changes, but just copying it over. The idea here is like a copy of a copy in a copy machine. If you start out with an original that's very, very good, and take a photocopy of it and then make a photocopy of the photocopy, eventually the copy that you get looks really, really bad. Uh, and that's the same thing with uh, JPEG. The more you, you copy the files and, and modify them, the uh, more information you lose from the file. Now, if you just simply take a picture, a JPEG picture, and you don't ever make any changes to it, then there's really no reason it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you have a JPEG or some other format. But the most common format today uh, that is lossless, meaning it doesn't lose quality if it's edited, is a TIFF image or TIF, uh, .tif or TIFF image. Now, historically, the reason why JPEGs were, were uh, preferred was because the file size was relatively small. Uh, small file size equates to few less information. So TIFF files were larger. And since file uh, storage was very expensive, uh, smaller files were desirable. Uh, today, uh, the cost of, of buying a file storage, a hard drive, for example, have gotten so low that um, it is practically um, practically negligible as a practical reality as the issue of whether you take a big file or a small file. Um, for example, today uh, I just checked the prices on a eight terabyte drive. That's eight thousand gigabyte drive. An eight terabyte drive is two hundred twenty nine dollars online at Amazon. So I, I think that, uh, and that would handle probably more photographs and more documents and more information than you can probably generate in your lifetime. Uh, it probably wouldn't take every movie if you just started copying movies down. Uh, it might fill it up someday, but uh, uh, for, for normal genealogical uh, data storage, uh, 
even a three terabyte or five terabyte drive is probably more than you would probably ever use. Um, the best way to store images is in raw format. Raw means that the image is taken from the camera completely without any, any um, changes or any changes to the file or the, or the document or the image itself. Most of the point and shoot cameras and all of the smartphones that you buy have processors. They're little computers that run their photos. And when, they, when you take a photo, the, their parts of the, the photo are, are actually uh, eliminated. They're compressed. And in the other part of the thing that happens is there's some um, different, th different uh, processes are applied to the photo to make it look nicer. Uh, so they, uh, their automatic image processing is built into all the cameras. Raw images sidestep that image. They allow uh, the, the image to be downloaded or taken from the cam camera without making any changes or losing any of the information. Uh, good news. The bad news is, of course, that there are only a few uh, cameras, and usually only of the professional level cam cameras that support raw image transfer. And uh, additionally, if you're going to use the film, the, the picture, uh, for instance, to upload it online or uh, print or whatever, then the, the raw image must be developed to pull it into a photo manipulation program like Photoshop or Lightroom or Bridge. And, uh, and Essentially, what you're doing is developing the photo, because it's uh, it's the equivalent of a of a negative image. The last um, format file format is Adobe Digital Negative. A digital negative includes a raw image, so if you have a camera raw image, you can uh, convert it into a, an Adobe Digital Negative. At which case, that the entire raw image is then um, uh, is made available. Now, one of the questions that comes up almost immediately is, what degree of editing is historically acceptable? And when we say historically acceptable, we mean from the archive standpoint. If you want to know whether or not an image is should be should be edited at all, period, then you need to talk to an archivist, a person who works at, a, at an archive that's, that uh, uh, maintains old photographs. These people will tell you exactly what the quality is. And the best place to find that out, by the way, is to look on the Library of Congress uh, website. That's loc.gov. And the, on the loc.gov website, there's a, a whole section on preservation and uh, all sorts of, of uh, documents in there on standards for preserving. And you'll find out that an archivist uh, does not interested in having the photo look nice or making your ancestors look lovely. They want to make sure that you preserve the, uh, for historical purposes, preserve the, ne the negative or the positive image exactly as it was produced or in the best possible condition that it could be maintained without being changed, without being edited. So the answer here is you can do only minor editing only, and that would be uh, uh, not uh, changing the way that the original photograph looked. And if you're going to do any editing at all, always preserve a copy of the original. Uh, very, very uh, important to preserve the original photograph. Uh, however, you, one thing you will learn about photographs if you maintain them for any period of time is that color photographs tend to have color shifts or changes because of the chemical compounds that they're made with. And uh, unless the photographs were printed by a very, very high quality printer, then, the, then there'll be substantial loss of detail and, and color from, uh, from a lot of even more uh, uh, from more recent photographs. The old camera processes, in fact, um, uh, glass negatives are extremely stable. Uh, the worst thing that happens is that they lose their, um, they don't, the, the uh, coating comes off of the glass, and so you actually lose the photograph. Here's, a, here's an example of a photograph that was not particularly well maintained. It's a copy of, it happens to be my great 
my grandfather, not my great grandfather, but my my fraternal grandfather there on the uh, right hand side of the image the, with the flat hat and the shadow across his face. So this was what the photo looked like when we uh, when I got it. Um, I could then spend a little bit of time with Photoshop and uh, this is what it looked like when it was repaired. Now, almost uniformly, everyone would say this photo now looks better than it did previously because we fixed it. And the answer to that is yes, but we have also added our own interpretation and evidence to the photo. And it is no longer a historical photo. It is a, an edited photo. And unless that editing process is documented, then it would be just the same thing as if you changed a document because you didn't like the wording or you changed a, a, a date on a, on a certificate because you disagreed with it. So here's a, another example of a photograph with some substantial damage. This one has a big tear across it. Actually, it's, the tear is all the way through. And uh, the only reason it looks like this is because I stuck the two pieces together and photographed it. So here we have the photograph. So now I'm pulling this into Photoshop. And I've taken out the first part of the, of the uh, tear. And then I took out the bottom part of the tear. And now I have to address what uh, the picture, the face, and uh, that's one of the more damaged parts of the photograph. So then I worked a while on the face, and now here's the photograph. And everyone, uh, almost uniformly, you would find people who had not have not been involved with conserving old photographs. They would have said, "Oh, that's so much better than having the big tear across the face." Well, the answer is. Look at his face. The part of the face on the right-hand side that, as, as we're looking at it, is now substantially different than the other side. Did he look like that in real life, in his lifetime? Um, the question is, how much of that is my interpretation of what the photograph should have looked like, and how much of it was uh, simply not there in the original? There's what this would be what you would want to preserve and if you went to this you would be uh, you would have to disclose to people that you had uh, had altered the original photograph now this is a problem because this is this is cosmetic damage uh, fortunately her face and most of the of the, the figure here uh, came through but those uh, black uh, uh, defects and the white defects are all part of what was happening when the, with the degrading of the of the glass negatives that hadn't been properly cared for should you change this because it looks bad uh, the answer is how are you going to fill in the information that you can't see and uh, I you could send this to a photo restorer and they could make this look lo really lovely but it would not be an original photograph. It would be an interpretation of what that person thought the photograph ought to look like. Same here. You see this, the, the disintegration of the border all the way around. Fortunately, has not gotten to the point where it's um, intruded on the on the class picture of the people in the in the image. Now here's a negative, and this was this was a, another kind of question. Uh, picture taken by my great grandmother, and you'll notice that it looks like she's leaning at about the camera is leaning at about a uh, 25 degree angle, 30 degree maybe 25 or 30 degree angle. Almost every single photo that my great grandmother took was tilted at an angle like this. It was just incredible. I talked to the archivist at the University of Arizona and I said, all these photographs are tilted. Can I straighten them? And they went and they talked together and they came back and told me on the phone. They said, well, we don't like it, but if, if they're all that way, why don't you straighten them? So we did. So I, when I um, developed the negative, 
and and uh, I straightened the horizon uh, simply by rotating the picture, uh, cropping it a tiny bit and rotating it. Um, for those of people, for those of you who may be members of the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or Mormons, uh, you might recognize uh, President Grant uh, there in the in the center of the photo. My two, my grandmother and her husband Henry Overson. Uh, are on the extreme left in this photo. Excuse me, I, I said Grant, didn't I? I said Smith. This is George Albert Smith. Sorry. Had a little bit of a brain freeze there for a second. Uh, kind of give a window of the past. Uh, this is probably the, one of the more unusual photos. Uh, what are those things sticking out of their heads? Uh, that was a, it seems like in this, the spectrum of these photos over the time, there was a period of time right after the, right around the turn of the century when that was a style. And it is a very strange style, but these, the girls all seem of a certain age, all seem to uh, have those uh, leaves sticking out of the top of their head for a while. Uh, things like this, including the clothing, are uh, very, very good ways of, of determining the time and narrowing down to within a year or two of when this photo would pro was probably taken. Now, this is a picture of what they lived like in eastern Arizona. Um, if you're used to nice houses and lawns and uh, trees, uh, you have to understand that this up there on the Colorado Plateau at almost uh, 5,500 feet above sea level between 5,500 and 5,600 feet above sea level. Uh, it's pretty dry and it's pretty uh, windy and it can be hot and cold, sometimes at the same time. No, not quite, but it uh, sometimes feels like it. In the past, and this gives us some timing, we were able also to, to determine the time by looking at the cars uh, the, the cars, the automobiles in this picture would be, uh, we would be able to date this photo within a year or two uh, of the time it was taken. Um, and this is a downtown, the main street downtown. If you were to take the same picture today uh, from the same location, those, uh, most of those same buildings would be there in that town. I thought this was an interesting photo because of what's on the walls. Those are, um, Navajo rugs. Uh, they are, uh, at the time that this picture was taken, uh, they were used for decoration purposes. Uh, today, a, a big Navajo rug like the one in the foreground on the right would probably sell for somewhere between twenty and $30,000. Uh, the, the, the value of the rugs that are in this photo would exceed the cost of that whole building by quite a large margin. Uh, this is another one that shows some changes over time. That ring of rocks around uh, the front of this little motel is uh, our petrified wood. Um, petrified wood is relatively uh, uh, plentiful in the in the area of, of at central north central Arizona, uh, but big pieces like this. Uh, have sold a piece like that at a at a big show like a big like the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show that's held in Tucson every Arizona every every early spring in February would sell for in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for each of those rocks. This is another shot of a of a town as it appeared in that back there in the eighteen hundreds. Some more of the showing the Catholic Church in uh, in St. John's, Arizona. That's that building was uh, the hotel was called uh, at that time it was called the Barth Hotel, and the Barths were early um, uh, Jewish settlers in um, in St. John's, Arizona. This is my grandmother. Uh, I don't know how many of you probably have a picture of your grandmother. If you're if you're young, it'd be unusual unless your grandmother grew up on a farm. But uh, it's always it's in, unusual to see uh, your grandmother on a horse, I suppose. And here's another interior shot. You can see here that they used uh, those Navajo rugs as uh, 
as flooring, floor covers for their homes. The value of that rug on the floor there, and I have no idea where that rug disappeared to, but uh, probably would be uh, uh, in very close to 10 or 50, probably close to 40 or $50,000. A hunting party. One thing you get used to looking at old photographs is that these people had a lot different sensibilities than we have today. Uh, some of the some of the things that you might see in old photographs um, are would not be what you would call politically correct. Uh, my family, uh, my grandfather and and my great grandfather, on the Tanner side, were all involved in road construction, and so there are a number of photos of people standing around in uh, in highway cuts or road cuts, and uh, that was because they were always going out to the construction sites and taking pictures. Another picture, one of my uncles, uh, showing some of the old cars. This is probably in the early 19 or mid 1920s. So one thing I would suggest is to be proactive in looking for photos and asking for permission to duplicate them. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask, and you may be able to help to preserve uh, some of these kinds of images that you've seen here. Uh, try to identify the people and places while those who know who they are are still alive. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of this particular large collection, most of the people uh, in the photos, nearly all, 100% of these people have long since passed away. And... Um, uh, they were taken, uh, most of the pictures, especially the glass negatives, were taken in the early 1900s. And so uh, there's very few people alive today who can still identify many of these people. Fortunately, we do have books with, uh, with pictures, photographic books. My grandmother, great-grandmother, pu uh, published a 700-page book of her genealogy. And in that book are all, a lot of these same photographs with the people identified. So that's very helpful. And if it's appropriate, and if it has some real uh, uh, historical significance, like these photographs do, then it's, it's appropriate to give those photographs to a record repository. But photos do bring the past to life. And here's what that photo looked like when it's, it's uh, been inverted and then um, a, a little bit of, uh, of contrast added so that the photo. Technically, the, the, the criteria that the uh, archivist gave uh, me when they, when they said this was, what would you do if you were developing the photo from the negative? And I said, well, okay, then I'll just pretend I'm developing a negative and, and make it look like a nice photo. And uh, sort of gives you a feeling for how the people lived and what they wore, what they did, uh, the kinds of things they were involved in and, and uh, what the children had to do and around. Uh, this is the St. John's Arizona High School Band. And this was a very rare surprise. Uh, in doing these photos from time to time, there would be people in them that I recognized and I was looking at this photo, uh, and it was interesting because I scanned the images, and there were a lot of them were negatives, and some were positives. But I wasn't having, a, I wasn't spending the time. I had thousands of them, and I wasn't spending the time to look at the photos. So it was only when I went back through the photos and looked at them that I really got to see what they were. And in this case, it turns out that this is Black Jack, John Pershing, who was the uh, the main general during World War I. Um, in fact, he was the highest ranking general in the United States Army for a long time. My, my grandfather served under General Pershing both in uh, the Mexican border war and also later in World War I. And I understand that with this photo is when General Pershing came to dedicate a war memorial at the University of Arizona campus and um, spoke and I'm assuming that my grandmother and great and my grandfather and, and my grandmother went down to watch um, the, the proceedings, the ceremony. This is my grandfather and grandmother. Um, 
Leroy Parkinson Tanner and uh, Eva Margaret Overson Tanner. And they, um, th that this is their wedding picture. So thanks for watching. Uh, this has been, uh, as I say, this is the beginning because uh, once you get into uh, preservation of old photos, that's just the very beginning of all the work you have to do to identify and preserve and conserve all of those wonderful photos. Uh, we're coming, uh, these webinars are being presented by the Brigham Young University Family History Library and they will be available eventually uh, when they are posted to the BYU Family History Library um, uh, YouTube channel. And so this will all, these will all be available at that point. Thank you for listening.